suggested to me that he said, you know, there's a guy, Jaron Lanier, I think, or something, who, who's, you know, he's really, every time you mention virtual reality, it, they mention this guy. Why don't you ask him? So I thought, okay. So I looked on the web, just did a Google search, found out uh, Jaron's name, and then asked him by email to, uh, to join us and tell us what he could about it. And, you know, they say, uh, well, look out for what you ask for. You might get it. Well, uh, he said yes. And then I thought, oh my God, the Future Systems BOF group is so small. We meet in Zach's living room. We seldom have more than eight people. Uh, someone with Jaron's credentials and, and depth of creativity, we really need a bigger audience. So that's how we ended up co-sponsoring uh, bringing Jaron to you tonight. So uh, I'm going to read. Marta has written up uh, something about uh, Jaron's background. I'm just going to read this to you so you'll know a bit about him too, and then I'll introduce him. Um, oh, by the way, he asked that people study and uh, start getting uh, questions about this. Did, has anyone looked at these top 11 reasons why virtual re Okay, good. So, good, good. So, Jaron Lanier is a computer scientist, a composer, a visual artist, and an author. He's probably best known for his work in virtual reality. In fact, he coined the term virtual reality in the early 1980s. He founded VPL Research, the first company to sell VR products. In the late 80s, he led the team that developed the first implementations of multi-person virtual worlds using head-mounted displays for both local and wide area networks, as well as the first avatars or representations of users within such systems. Until recently, Lanier served as the lead scientist of the National Tele-Immersion Initiative, a coalition of research universities studying advanced applications for Internet 2. Internet 2. basics of what we're talking about, go back um, a, a couple decades and talk about what VR was thought about as being then. And I think the very idea of it has shifted a little bit over time. Uh, then I'm going to go through my list. I want to compare it to an earlier list I'd forgotten about when you asked the question, which was by a guy named Ivan Sutherland, which is very interesting to look at. And that's from an, uh, decades earlier still. Um, and then talk a little bit about prospects and where this is going. So first of all, if we go back 20 years, what was, all, what was all this fuss about back then? Now, um, the term virtual reality um, is a play on an earlier term that was made up by a guy named Ivan Sutherland, which was virtual world. Now, by the, who, who, anybody here who hasn't heard of Ivan Sutherland? Just admit it if you haven't. It's all right. All right. OK, cool. So Ivan Sutherland is one of the important computer scientists. He invented computer graphics. And he invented, really, the idea of a, user inter a graphical user interface as well. Um, he's uh, one of the really fundamental thinkers in the foundation of computer science. He's in the generation, like the very first generation that made up computers was Turing, von Neumann, Shannon, uh, Wiener, if you know who those people are, I don't know, but that's, they, they made up the abstractions that were, allowed us to make these uh, 
uh, these sort of um, general purpose machines, except they never quite work right. So they figured out how to get us to that point. <laughs> and then Ivan was part of the next generation who figured out, well, what would these things actually look like? And so he started computer graphics, and then some other people started artificial intelligence, and some other people started databases and so forth. So there's a, he's part of that second generation that made up the particulars of what a computer would be. He's really a smart guy. Uh, he's, he's, current, he's living in the valley here somewhere now. He's working in Sun Research on um, chips without clocks where all the little pieces find each other asynchronously. That's his current research passion. Uh, so anyway, a long time ago, he, so he, he did this, this little uh, PhD project, a dissertation called Sketchpad which a lot of people consider to be the greatest program ever written. Uh, and it, it was just this one little program, and in it he invented the world of computer graphics, and he, he invented the idea of user interfaces, and all this uh, visual programming was in there, all this amazing stuff. It's very much worth seeing. There's some videos of it you can find on the web. Then, in 65, he wrote a paper called The Ultimate Display, where he proposed a head-mounted display where you could see a virtual world, and he actually built one in 69. Uh, sort of a dangerous one. It was called the Sword of Damocles by some people because there's this big heavy thing hanging over your head. But he made it, and he wrote um, he wrote his own list, a little bit like mine, which I I just did a Google search to find uh, I, to find a copy of it. And here's somebody from Georgia Tech who made a paraphrased list of them, um, and uh, the original was in Datamation, 1966. And so just search for Ivan Sutherland Google ten unsolved problems, and you can find you can find it. It's been reprinted a lot. So. Uh, from the perspective of 1966, this was the, the list of 10. I made it 11 in honor of Spinal Tap. Does everybody get that joke? <laughs> if, you don't ra if you don't get the joke, raise your hand. OK, in, there's a movie called Spinal Tap, which is a parody of heavy metal bands. And the guitarist has an amp that turns all the way to 11 to give him that extra ump versus other guitarists. And somebody says, well, why don't you just set it so that 10 is louder? So, but, but 11 is more. So. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so um, the reason mine's 11 actually is that in the first, I, I did a top 10 like a Letterman list the, in the answer to, to Tom's first email, and then I thought of another one in conversation, so it became 11 and became Spinal Tapish. Anyway, this is a par this is uh, somebody at Georgia Tech's paraphrasing of Ivan Sutherland's unsolved problems in computer graphics and user interface from 1966, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, some of them are kind of solved, and some of them are just moot, and some of them we don't have a clue about. So, um, just you know, going so hardware characteristics and cost um, is the cost part is solved, the characteristics part isn't. We still have these awkward, unreliable, hard to interface objects, but they're cheap. Um, the <laughs> what he means by problems of technique, e.g., rubber banding, is user interface for manipulating things. Uh, for manipulating static things, I think we're there. For dynamics, we're not. Coupling, pro coupling problems, uh, display to simulation. How do you, how do you um, have something behind the scenes that's running what you see on the screen that has some depth to it? We do not know how to do that yet. We're still using, for the most part, very crude dynamics in all our video games and everything. Describing motion in the sense he meant it, we have solved. We figured out how to do um, algorithms that can describe equations of motion and very efficiently. Digital halftoning, we got it. In fact, if anything, my worry these days is that the cheap, I don't know, do any of you know what a GPU shader is? There's these, a GPU is a reference to these cheap little graphics cards that come to play video games now, and they're very powerful lately from companies like Radeon, the, I mean, the ATI Radeon or the, the NVIDIA and so forth. And they have these little shader algorithms, which are little algorithms you can set up to affect what an object looks like as the scan line is painted across. And they're so fascinating that they've sucked in the whole graphics research community to write these little shaders. I'm like, stop it with the shaders already. It's driving me nuts. But anyway, we've definitely gotten to the point where we can describe halftoning. Um, Structure of drawings, we're, we're great at describing things. We've solved six. Seven, hidden line removal, obsolete. It's a moot point at this point. That's, that's <coughs> from the days of vectors, and you try to figure out how to get rid of the hidden line behind an object, and it was a really hard problem. It's amazing to think that was so hard. Um, and we don't even think about that anymore. We just do. We can do transparent objects if we, in fact, in fact, it turned, with the invention of the z-buffer, it became easier to do opaque objects than transparent ones. And we had to then figure out how to get transparency back when we wanted it. But anyway, that's all old history now. Um, uh, 
program instrumentation, what he's talking about is how the hell to really tell a computer what to do. How do you really design a program? And in his original Sketchpad program, he actually had little graphical programming tools. Um, for our work in virtual reality 20 years ago, we also did visual programming techniques. Programming still sucks, and it's an unsolved problem. Um, nine. Um, hierarchical modeling. What this is about is how do you set up the logical relationships be between components of something you see in a virtual world? Are they all in a tree? Are they in some sort of database relationship? For instance, um, you can make a tree, like for instance, fingers on hands, on arms, on bodies, very nicely because you can make a hierarchy of, of matrix transformations. And that's how a lot of 3D description languages like GL and even things like RenderMan work. There's this hierarchy of, of matrix. By the way, if any, it, I, I, with an audience like this, I, I know there's a mixture of people who are sort of interested in user interface but aren't technical people and came out of maybe a design school, and then there are people who are really hardcore mathematicians. And I'm trying to kind of set this fuzzy in between that makes sense to everybody. Please, if I say something that's too technical, please don't be shy about asking me what I meant. Um, that's really fine. If I say something that's not technical enough, like, well, what kind of transformation do you mean exactly? Um, <laughs> Ask me later, okay? <laughs> All right, because I'll tell you, but I, you know, maybe it's, it, I have a feeling this is sort of a mixed crowd, but, you know, there are a lot of civilians present. So, um, uh, so this hierarchical model, modeling thing is not solved. You know, we know how to do trees, we can do some things that aren't trees, but we really haven't gotten our figured that out. And then working with abstractions, what's funny is in Ivan's world from 1966, these different categories might not seem different to us today. And honestly, I don't understand what this, this 10 means from this person's redaction of it, and I don't remember the original, so I'll just leave that as a mystery. Anyway, um, I'll bring up my 11 here. Um, and I'll just, I guess only nine will fit on the screen. I don't, I'm not gonna bother with trying to change the font or anything. Um, now, uh, first of all, just let's define virtual reality so we can talk about what is or isn't present. The, the term virtual reality was supposed to be a play on what Ivan Sutherland had called the thing he saw through the first head mount display he made. So he called that a virtual world, which is interesting. The term virtual, um, had a lot of play in the scientific world because, for instance, physicists were already talking about virtual particles, something that's as if it were there, even though in some sense it isn't. And so he said, well, we'll just make a whole virtual world out of this thing he called the ultimate display. Now, um, what I was interested in is extending that into the world of social experience where there'd be more than one person at a time. And I thought the term reality would indicate that transfer from the focus on the environment with perhaps a single user to the social world of how people share and experience and perceive each other. So that, that was that use of the term reality. My colleagues at the time hated it. I remember one guy I worked with, Chuck Blanchard, saying, oh, it sounds like RV. It's like implying that all these retirees will be in virtual worlds <laughs> because VR, you know. And I said, oh, well, you know, I can't think of anything better. And we all, thought it, we all thought it was like a really bad, awkward term that nobody would use. And then it turned into this term of, you know, the standard term and this uh, term that's wildly misused in popular culture. So um, I don't know why exactly that happened, but it did. Uh, the, um, there are several different ways of thinking about virtual reality that are all useful and valid. Um, to people who are, to, who are trying to study human cognition, virtual reality is uh, instrumentation that tries to fool human cognition as a tool for understanding it. And that's um, an important stream of research and, ex and interesting. Um, it's interesting because it's shown time and time again what a moving target human cognition is. Uh, that what works in virtual reality one year might not work in a later year because people's expectations have changed or their systems have adapted and have gotten wise enough to perceive the, the loose ends and the cracks in virtual reality that used to look good. You know, and um, this is something we knew from other media forms that were simpler than virtual reality. I mean, some of my favorite anecdotes are uh, the uh, Civil War era ph photographers who would sell generic photos that were pro like, well, here's a thin person with a mustache. And it, was, it became cheaper to mass produce these photographs than to mass paint them at any level of detail. And so people could buy an image that looked at least a little bit like somebody. and so. You know, a photo was valuable when it wasn't even of the right person. 
And that gives you a sense, you know, that there was this value there just in the idea of a cheap image that was all filled in. Um, and uh, another great example from the world of sound is uh, some of the first generation audio recording technologies in controlled scientific experiments with control groups and all the, all the checks and balances you need to be able to publish. Listeners couldn't tell an early wax recording from a real opera singer behind a curtain. And so you can, you can get it, and now you, know, you can, go, Palo Alto being the town that it is, you can go and spend an arbitrarily large amount of money on arbitrarily good audio speakers, and they're people who learn to tell the difference. You know? So, so um, human acuity is an adaptive system. It does adapt, it does change. Human cognition has fixed elements, but also has variable elements, and people who build virtual reality systems have helped to find which are fixed and which are variable. So that's, been, that's one life of virtual reality. That, now, but that also implies something important about a second definition of virtual reality, which is for people who are interested in user interfaces, you don't have to get it perfect to call it virtual reality. All you have to do is fool the human nervous system. All you know, I mean, it's still hard, but <laughs> um, there's a there's a sense in which every working virtual reality experience that's ever happened is sort of a trick. A trick in the sense of magic tricks on stage. There's an element of misdirection and fooling you that goes on, uh, and that's just got to be the way it is. Because, for instance, if you know, uh, one of my favorite examples. This is an early experiment done in virtual reality, as you um, you make a virtual tabletop or here a podium top, and you ask somebody to slam their hand down on it, and you put in as many little cues as you can, indicating that their hand is really hitting that surface. There's a converging shadow. There's a nice little thwomp sound all of those things, but there's no actual haptic feedback. Haptic is the word we use for things that are physical, touch and feel, all that stuff, that's haptic. So there's nothing to actually stop your hand, you can just pass right through it. But, an but I don't remember, the, the percentages have changed in different experiments over the year, but a substantial percentage of people have their hands stop. They're, they believe it, all right? Now, of course, if you tell them, hey, your hand's gonna stop even though nothing's there, then they'll go through. So as in the dynamics of stage magic, uh, you know, the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a psychological factor in which the person is, is um, fooled, and that's a part of it. But of course, what you realize is there's a continuum between those, that trickery that makes virtual reality interfaces work and the trickery that allows us to perceive the world around us as real any time. And, and the reason there's a continuum is because our sense organs aren't perfect. So, just in order to have this room, which is real, so far as I know, feel real, your brain has to cover up mistakes in your sensory system in exactly the same way that it had to invent this blockage when you're moving your hand down. There are many, many examples of that, but perhaps the most dramatic one is the blind spots. Uh, your, the way our retina works, um, because evolution screwed up, unlike, say, with the octopus where it got it right, um, we have, when the optic nerve comes through, there's a hole, so you're blind, you're blind in these pretty big holes in each retina, and they're like pretty close to the front. They're like about here for me, one for each eye. So you're just absolutely blind, but you're hardly ever aware for it. And in fact, humanity went through thousands of generations of thinking about all kinds of things before somebody discovered these spots. You know, so somehow we, we, we just we pretend we're seeing where we don't. It's our brain just filling it in and guessing. And it's exactly that kind of adaptation. I mean, that one's more hardwired because it's been around for so long. But even so, there's a continuum between that sort of covering up for flaws in our, in our, in our uh, senses and the kinds of tricks that allow virtual reality to feel real. So anyway, so this brings us to the second definition of virtual reality, which is um, it's good enough to fool you. And good enough to fool you means good enough to be a useful user interface, good enough to be a fun user interface, and so forth. What it takes to fool you could change over time or in different people or in different cultures, so it's a moving target, not a fixed one. And uh, it's essentially, therefore, cultural. So that, uh, that kind of virtual reality is not one size fits all, one era works for all eras. Rather, it just is, it, it's something that will always be adapting, like a cultural product. Now, this leads to a question, which goes back many decades now, which is, could you make perfect virtual reality? I mean, like, what if you just do, you, you hire some cognitive scientists and you measure the acuity of every aspect of human perception, you write down the numbers, this is the angular resolution, this is how many d shades of volume you can distinguish, this is how many shades of color you can distinguish, you do all this, then you make a machine that does all that, then you're done, you know? Well, no, <laughs> I don't think so, although this is controversial. See, what I think is that the adaptive components of human cognition are prevalent enough 
that we can always, there's a cat and mouse game where we can always adapt around whatever somebody thought was the perfect VR system. And so, um, and we're so good at it that as with the case of audio recording that I mentioned or the history of photography, our expectations will rise and we'll figure out a way to perceive um, the, the rough edges of whatever system somebody proposes at a given time. Now remember, the way human cognition, the state of human cognition is like the state of all biology. It's this weird conglomeration of ridiculous kludges like backwards retinas with holes in the middle of them together with intense refinement to the limit of what's possible. So the way, the way evolution works is you have perfection on top of kludges. That's evolution, that's biology. It's the, it's the weirdest thing, but it's who we are. So uh, you know, your, your retina can, in some cases, be perfectly sensitive, meaning it can respond in ideal conditions to a single photon. Your, um, your, your haptic sensibility, I mean, measuring feel, the degree to which you can distinguish thicknesses and paper needed between your fingers is absolutely astonishing and, and appears to be close to a physical limit. So evolution can tweak things to a physical limit, but only on top of yesterday's kludges. Isn't that wild? So anyway, for that reason, because of these little piercing zones of perfection in the design that evolution comes up with, it becomes pretty hard to really make the perfect VR system. That's another argument against it. So this is all in the service of that second definition of virtual reality, which is good enough to fool you. All right, but then there's a third one, which to me is the most interesting one, and which perhaps hasn't really come about yet, even in early forms, which is the one that fascinates me which is that virtual reality is a technology that facilitates connections between people in which humans are able to use the whole of the sensorum to communicate better with one another. All right, and so this is the one in which I think of virtual reality as a form of communication that's not so much an extension of the PC or other media forms, but it's more an extension of talking. It's like with, with um, the usual, I'm not going to go through the whole riff on this because it takes an hour. It's like a whole other talk I give. But I give this alternate history of our species where I, where I talk about um, this ramp of improvement where instead of, it, uh, instead of us learning how to manipulate nature more and more with like the wheel and fire and then the steam engine and so forth, I talk about ways that people connect together, starting with talking. The great thing about talking is that it leverages the one little part of the universe that you can move as fast as you think and feel which is your mouth and your hands to some, you know, if you're, if you're sign language. Those are the only parts of the universe you can move as fast as you think and feel. Everything else takes more time. And through the mechanism of symbology, you leverage that little part that you can manipulate fast to refer to all the stuff that you can't manipulate fast. So it's like a, a hack, if you will, to use uh, local terminology. So um, uh, if you can make, if you could solve the list of problems that Ivan Sutherland had defined in 1966 and actually have a good way to describe virtual worlds, or a good way to program them, a good way to organize them, if we can ever get to that point, which is a huge challenge, perhaps someday people could improvise the contents of shared virtual worlds as a form of communication. So they would actually be able to manipulate the whole of everything instead of just their little mouths and hands. And that's a thing I call post-symbolic communication, of being able to manipulate the whole of perceived reality as a form of communication with the fluidity that we manipulate symbols. All right, that's a slightly esoteric idea. We, I don't want us to get too lost in that because we're really, the topic of this talk is about something closer at hand, which is, we all want this cool, arbitrary world's technology in our lives. Where the hell is it? <laughs> OK, so everybody wants that. Everyone wants that, like this amazing sort of, so the, I think the longing that people feel is for some, it's like sort of the psychedelic thing, where you can experience these dramatic different worlds. And it's, and it's like, a, so this, um, I remember the, the first uh, Wall Street Journal front page story on virtual reality had this headline right over the top saying, electronic LSD latest thing from Silicon Valley, I'm like, oh no, oh god, these guys. So, um, so, but anyway, that's the longing, is for like this, this sort of intense, very exotic kind of experience. So, um, now the, the, the caveat I wanna give here before I start going through my own list 
which is very important to me, is that if you, th and I put this at the bottom of the list, so I'll just scroll down to this. Having said all this, please remember, <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about all the reasons that this kind of intense, uh, you know, consumer arbitrary, subjective, amazing psychedelic experience, why that isn't happening yet. I do want everybody to remember that as a industrial technology, virtual reality has succeeded by just about any measure. And I just, let me just talk about that um, with maybe a touch of bragging, because I do feel good about how much it's contributed. Um, probably the thing that's the most important to me is that a, uh, one application of virtual reality, which started just about exactly 20 years ago right here at Stanford, which is using virtual worlds to simulate surgery in order to improve surgical, surgical procedures, is working really well. Uh, I, I spent part of each summer at Dartmouth Med where we're working on such things. And um, we have, uh, we're, we're working in the thousands of cases with patients who are simulated in advance of surgical procedures in order to improve outcomes and we can demonstrate substantial outcome improvements. And so this thing is working and I'm very excited about it. The hardware scalable, the software so far is being ornery as software often will be so that whether we can deal with soft, distributing software at this level of complexity in mass has never happened and that's the, that's the problem holding it back. But we have sh we've proven that application. Um, you cannot buy a car that wasn't designed using a virtual reality system. You cannot, um, what, <laughs> this issue about putting gas in it is an interesting one because I have mixed feelings about it. If you go back to, uh, so I made up the term like over 20 years ago now, I forget exactly when, probably 81 or something, so 22 years ago. At that time, everybody thought the oil would be running out now. And what happened is computers made the oil last longer because, and it wasn't virtual reality by itself, but virtual reality played a role. Basically, we learned how to make models of oil fields that predicted more efficiently where the rest of the oil would be to make old fields more reliable. And mechanical CAD tools were able to design new extraction machinery. And computer-controlled remote devices were able to maintain that machinery. And, and in addition to all that, virtual reality interfaces made it all comprehensible and usable by engineers at companies like Schlumberger. So the result was to increase the apparent amount of oil and make it seem cheaper than it really was and perhaps make us slam into a wall instead of having market pressures gradually force us to wean off it. So that might have been a really bad thing. but. The history isn't written yet on that, so we'll see how it goes. But at any rate, um, as an industrial technology, virtual reality has had a huge impact and a very satisfying one. But as with industrial technologies, I mean, we're talking about a relatively small number of users. Uh, as far as ho I haven't, I don't have a firm number on the on the count of high-end industrial virtual reality systems that I'd really call VR myself, but it's in the low thousands probably. My sense is that. In the auto industry, well, it might even be in the low tens of thousands at this point. The auto industry has a couple thousand. The oil industry has perhaps approaching 10,000. Pharmaceuticals have some thousands. So I don't know. But it's a, there, there are, there are uh, and I don't know if calling them desks is the right thing. But at any rate, <laughs> these, these, uh, these, as an industrial technology, it is happening, and it's good. And, and at the, an industrial virtual reality installation often costs more than a million dollars just in hardware, much less all the training and staff for it. So it's a big, it's, it's a big installation. It's, and, and they're typically not available to the public. And unfortunately, decent VR is almost never available to the public at all anywhere. And that's very frustrating. But alas, that is just the way of the world. OK. Now, consumer VR. Um, this, this list of 11 reasons isn't in any particular order. And I'm, I, I'm tempted. Oh, somebody call out a number. I heard five first, so let's see what five is. Interface components still need better screens. Yeah. So here's the deal with this. Um, VR is highly dependent on may being able to reuse components that someone else needs a lot of so that they can get cheap enough. And so the screens are a great example of that. Um, if you, if you want to do goggle-style VR, you have to have screens that are small enough and light enough that you could stick them on your head. And they have to have tremendous resolution because, of course, it's being spread out over a wide field of view. So let's say a K by K screen might look perfectly sharp if it's taking up a very small portion of your field of view on a monitor outside of you. But if you're, if you're wrapping it around your whole field of view, the pixels get kind of fat. So you need substantially more, perhaps as a general rule of thumb, a magnitude up from what you'd want on a desktop. 
um, displays that could meet the needs of VR are buildable today. And in fact, there's some niche markets that, that can afford them. Um, and uh, so for instance, uh, Kaiser makes some military head mounts where what they do is they, they very carefully combine a bunch of little screens together to, in a mosaic to make a big screen that's suitable for widescreen VR. But it's, just a, it's a very expensive device. It's an esoteric device and it's not gonna be created in mass. So what's the problem? Well, it's weird, you know, What's happening now is that Moore's law has this ugly underbelly, which is that uh, even as component costs go down, the investment costs and in facilities to bring those prices down goes up. So, you know, the price per chip can go down, but the price to bring up a new chip facility goes up. And the same thing is true for displays. And so you have you have to place these ever larger bets to tool up to make the next the next uh, step on Moore's law come about. And so therefore. There's a sort of a negative effect of Moore's law in that the people who make these investments in the new, to tool the new manufacturing have to, by the nature of the situation, get kind of conservative. Um, and for a lot of, like for, for central processing units, it's not so bad because they are really pretty general devices. But for some other components, it's been a bit unfortunate. So two examples are just finally when some of the basics of LCD technology kind of got good enough that we're all like ready for these little screens you really want, the bigger market is to, is to make big flat screens. So everybody's tooling for those because they want to replace CRTs and that seems like a more sure bet. I can't blame them for it, but it's kind of a shame. Another great example is the blue LED. You know, we, we waited for decades for the damn blue LED because then you could do all these tricks with displays that like you could, since LEDs can switch so fast, you can have a very small number of LEDs that are reflected through a moving component or some sort of thing like that and create the illusion of a large display. And we always had red and green, but not blue. So somebody in Japan came up with blue and then instead of really tooling up to make them so we could build displays with them and improving them, everybody said, no, 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 let's just push it to ultraviolet because then we can use it for higher higher density data retrieval in, in, in optical devices. So, there, so the data retrieval market seem more important than the display market. So we keep on like, you know, pay attention to us, please. <laughs> but you know, the, it just turns out that uh, as it happens, there have been these other market pulls that have required these big investments. So, so that's the dynamic behind the lack of the components that we really want. Um, the, the technologies it currently exist to make um, a display that I think would make us all happy. As you remember my argument before, it wouldn't be perfect because I believe that it would, we're chasing a moving target with human perception, but we definitely have the technology now that we did not have 20 years ago to make us happy. It's just that the capital is being diverted to more certain bets. So we're still waiting for those components. It's gotta happen, you know, that's, and um, so that's five. All right, give me another number. Did one or three happen first? What do you think? Two. <laughs> okay. I, I appear to be dealing with humans. <laughs> well, let's see what three is. Um, three, expensive data content. Yeah, okay, so this is a good one. All right, so you go back to the, the dawn of personal computers, and somebody said, hey, I'll make, a, I'll make a, a word processor. And the first, as I remember it anyway, the first personal computer word processor was something called electric pencil on some 6502 machine. Anybody remember that? Yeah, so, but the thing about it is that that would become useful. All you have to do is start writing a little memo and ta-da, it's useful. And the first, the early spreadsheets were useful even with just a few cells filled in, you could do little things. VR doesn't become useful until you've specified the world, as Ivan Sutherland pointed out in his 10 reasons that I started with. So you have to have this enormous labor to enter, you know, to get data up to the threshold where you care about it. You can't just enter a few little things. This was very painfully clear in the 80s when a zillion, well, hundreds of universities started VR labs. And you'd visit some, some university and say, hey, come to our VR center, we're all excited, we spent all this money, we hired faculty, and look at our rotating cube. <laughs> and you know, again and again, you'd see these sort of either reusing the same data sets over and over again, the sort of teapot syndrome, or does everybody get that? I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> or, um, or you see the damn rotating cube, like, no more cubes. Don't, don't, <laughs> you know, I just, I just had like this, this uh, I, I really wanted to ban the rotating cube for a while. The, the teapot is more appealing. I kind of like the teapot. But, um, 
it's just hard, you know, it's hard data to make. And what, what typically happens is by the time you've just gotten the VR thing to work at all, the budget's gone and everybody's exhausted, and so you just have energy left to make the cube. So the data, uh, <laughs> Now, what's, what's, what's happened since then that's changed things is data acquisition from reality has improved a lot. So now, like um, volumetric data acquisition in medicine has improved enormously. We have, a, we have a, you know, a crush of volumetric data from MRI devices. Um, we have a lot of um, three-dimensional data from satellites of the world. We have a lot of data from camera arrays of just uh, human-scale reality that's three-dimensional and all sorts of other devices. So there's like all this raw data. So now there's a lot of real-world data that arrives and then also there's just been enough use of, of hand-operated modelers that there are enough models out there on the web and there's companies that sell catalogs of little models like cars and what have you. So there's getting to be a lot of static 3D data. But unfortunately that is enough because to be in a virtual world it ought to do something. It's got to respond. So if all you care about is static stuff, there's getting to be more of it. Dynamics, like models that actually do something, there's still no agreed way to distribute them. Well, I'll get to that's actually a different reason. But we still, we still have the same problem, that there's just that making the data useful, just to get so that the whole thing becomes useful, is much more labor intensive than for any other style of user interface. There we go. What was the other, was one the other number there? Or should I I'll start again? Give me another number. I think I heard four first. Too many charlatans. Okay, so here maybe I'm being a little nasty, but the thing is, um, a lot of our, a lot of the stuff, so um, this weird thing happened to me in the early 80s where I ended up with a company without meaning to. And, and the story, this is absolutely true. I, some of my stuff was on the cover of an issue of Scientific American in like 83 or 84 or something. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, somebody, some, I got this call from somebody who's from one of the venture capital companies in town saying, hey, you need investment. And I was saying, I do? And suddenly there was this company, and I was utterly unprepared. I was, I was like a ridiculous CEO. I had absolutely no idea what to do. But at any rate, we had one of these like classic Silicon Valley ridiculous startups with hippie kids, and nobody, and just it was just bizarre. But at any rate, um, <laughs> the thing is, our our early products were funky. They were unreliable. We were we none of us had a background in manufacturing, and we had we had a lot of learning to do to figure out how to make something like a glove that would actually last in the field. And it was it was kind of painful. But we never sort of pretended that we were what we weren't. Like I would never place one of these gloves out for public use and pretend it would work because it was really not at that point. But there were all these other people, at least four or five, that said, hey, we'll make money with this stuff. And they showed up in malls with like these things called VR with like helmets and, and gloves and these sort of very simple experiences. And it was just premature. It was just, a, it was just an inappropriate thing. And they would charge a buck a minute. And Again and again, I would talk to people, oh, yeah, we went to the mall to see virtual reality. It sucked. <laughs> oh. So it was a problem. And um, I think that phase is kind of over now. Um, I mean, these days, if people know about virtual reality at all, they probably know about it from these movies where they've been given like insane expectations, like The Matrix or something. But at least they think it's cool, so that's better. Uh, <laughs> OK, next number. One. Let's see what one is. Um, Gates Envy. Yeah, yeah. Do you ever wake up in the morning with this burning desire to sell inadequate software and make billions of dollars? Does it just like grip you? It's like, I could sell crap and make a fortune. So I, no, I shouldn't, I have this funny relationship with Microsoft because I, a lot of the guys, most of the technical people there and the founders are people I know, and some of them I'm, are, I'm even close to, and I, but I, I kind of razz them a little bit. They can't afford it, you know, and, um, but what happened was this paradigm was born that if you jump in there early and you can grab thing, you can grab it and, and be the person who rides something into standardhood, there's this potential fortune to be made, right? And that doesn't work with virtual reality. You know, just because just as I was pointing out before, like just entering the data is hard. Well, like just writing the software is really hard. It's not like a word processor or a spreadsheet. It's really, it involves an intersection of understanding issues in human cognition and understanding how to model physical systems with dynamics and understanding how to model constraints. And, and uh, it, like there are all these things that are very hard. I mean, there's a sophisticated thing. I don't claim to understand how to do it. All I, all I can claim at this point is I've been beaten up enough that I can respect the problems, you know, and I think 
think, um, and and I think that's actually saying a lot because this is actually this is really hard stuff, and so. Um, I, I named two here that I felt were inadequate, and I feel a little bad because I know the people who did these two, and I don't, I sh in a way, I feel a little bit bad dissing them in public. They should be able to defend themselves if I'm going to do that. But VRML was a great example where a bunch of people jumped in and said, hey, it'll be like HTML, but for virtual reality, and we're going to be famous, and what? And it was like just junk. You couldn't do anything with it. It was the rotating cube software, you know? And, um, and uh, Java 3D was a bit deeper, but still was naive. It wasn't built out of experience of actually building apps. You know, it was really coming, it was like, hey, there's, you know, this will be HTML for VR, this will be Java for VR. Um, unfortunately, all the people who actually built serious apps were so exhausted by the time they were done, they never got tools, you know, as a side effect from the experience. Now, um, there are some good VR tools around, but there aren't any adequate VR tools around yet. Um, so I want to I want to praise the people who are working on the tools, but I also want to point out that none of them are really good enough yet. I'll mention a few that I like just so I can say something positive, and I should have put that in print. Um, Paul Mylanek and company down in Los Gatos have a company doing a thing with two-handed modeling in virtual reality that's very good and incorporates constraints and physical modeling into a design environment. And they've he's worked on it. Paul's worked on it for. A long, I can't remember the first time I started working with him, but it's going back to the 80s, and he's, he's really clawed his way up to the point of being able to write good software. I bet you're going to ask, what's it called? Uh, I'll do a Google search so I can find, I'll, I'll find it for you before the end of the night. I'm sorry I don't remember the name of the product or the company, but it's a startup in, in Los Gatos. They're doing a very good job on one aspect of things. Um, on uh, general VR stuff, um, at, at, at my old company, VPL, in the 80s, we had a tool called Body Electric, which is a graphical da data flow-oriented programming environment that's optimized for um, interactions between 3D objects for things like, in, like a hierarchical relationship and, uh, and object uh, contact detection and dealing with things about haptics and special display considerations. I still use it because nothing else can do what it does, even though it's incredibly antiquated in many ways. Um, I, I'm desperately wanting better software. Um, what's urgent, though, is that people who want to develop for VR have to pay the dues of actually building something complicated in VR that works first so they can appreciate the problems. You can't build a tool for this stuff unless you've really done a major project in it with real users, real data. Then you know what you're talking about. So if any of you want to get into it, I encourage you. I'll help you. Be prepared for work, OK? <laughs> this is not an HTML editor. Um, all right, next number, two. two. Slow computers, yeah, you know, this is a funny thing. We've had an exemption for Moore's Law in graphics. I don't know who decided that. Well, I guess the market sort of did. But um, the top level performance you could get in real-time 3D graphics, which is what you need for this, hasn't budged in five years. It's gotten cheaper, but it hasn't budged. So five years ago, you could buy this refrigerator from SGI or from some of its competitors like Evans and Sutherland, um, named for the same Sutherland, uh, <coughs> um, or a few others. Hewlett Packard has some stuff. And you could, you, you'd spend 100,000 bucks on the refrigerator, plug it in, and you got graphics. And it was about like what you can get from a top-end card these days in a PC. But the, the ceiling hasn't budged. Um, that's crazy. No, I didn't see that one coming. You know, I thought that we were going to have a nice Moore's Law in 3D graphics, but we didn't. We, we, hit, uh, we hit a flat zone that, that was ex really extended. We, for a whole generation, everything in real-time 3D has been based on a fixed set of performance expectations. That's extremely unusual in the history of computer science. It's very rare. And I'm afraid it's had a negative effect on a whole generation of people who've come up in school during this period and have had their imaginations in a way limited by that. Um, we're about to burst through that finally. I mean, it's like, it's, it's taken an unbelievably long time. There's two mechanisms that are gonna help us burst through that particular plateau. One is just that the game cards are getting better. Although, uh, it's a bit tricky there too because it's not entirely clear that the market pressures are driving those companies in the right direction for, for for VR, for instance, a lot of them are investing in putting things like TV tuners on the card or something instead of really pushing the, um, the scene complexity. Um, now, um, all of the major workstation vendors that used to sell refrigerators are selling new refrigerators where they put a bunch of these game cards together and try to aggregate them in some way. And they all have different strategies, and um, none of that is really quite 
performing in the way you'd want just yet, but I think a lot of them are serious. So um, Evans and Sutherland has one, HP has one, um, Silicon Graphics has one, and there's some startups doing it too. So hopefully some of that's going to come together pretty soon. Um, and uh, I've, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm a little involved in the SGI one to try to get it uh, to start to perform, and I'm, I'm kind of hopeful that that'll work. Um, but it's funny, you know, like the, the game card companies are in such intense competition with each other that they can't spare even the second to do one little thing to make it easier for people to do these aggregations. So the people, the, the people trying to do the new refrigerators built out of game cards are sort of pulling teeth, just trying to work around the quirks of the game cards that are really just intended to, you know, be the choice of the new Dell or whatever. So uh, that's two. Next number. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. What happened? Well, you know, there are different, there are different opinions about that. Um, it appears to be a little bit more of an economic phenomenon than a technical phenomenon. Um, and specifically, it's, it's, it's the econom economics of employment, that the, the, there was a population of people who just liked engineering uh, the, the uh, gra uh, graphics hardware. And, and doing ASICs for doing matrix computations and fill line algorithms and stuff. And a lot of them just got better jobs at the game card companies. And it's not so much that the market went away from the, I, I think the market demand would have been there for next generations of workstation companies, but the labor force couldn't fill the niches to do both. And so the labor force was drawn to the card companies. And, and uh, the people who like to do that were depleted in the workstation companies. So that was my observation at the time. Now, obviously, Moore's Law, even though we like to think that Moore's Law is like this automatic clockwork thing that just happens, it's actually this incredible sort of um, effort of will and creativity of worlds of people who try to make it happen. And uh, there were definitely technical challenges, but I think that they could have been surmounted. It's just that the population was drawn to a different task. So I, th I think it was a sociological and, and personal economic phenomenon more than um, either a lack of market desire in that niche or an unsoluble technical problem. So there you are. Um, did we have another number yet? <laughs> Say again? Oh, sure. Mm. Well, I'm not aware of any of the video game companies working on that problem in a way that I think will go anywhere. I mean, essentially what's happening, but let me tell, first, let me praise one, somebody. Okay, so um, let me say somebody who I think is doing a good job before I trash people so I can be positive, okay? Because I know it's, it's so easy to trash and so hard. So let me, somebody doing good work on the problem of how to run a lot of people with virtual worlds connected at the same time is Philip Rosedale, who's the retired chief technology officer from Real Networks, and he started as a labor of love, this shared virtual world company called called Linden Labs, and they have a little shared world called Second Life, and they're really trying to do it. The people who are doing most of, most of the shared virtual world stuff is based on, the, on an inadequate model that was developed for, for military simulation, but I believe is not adequate for military simulation, in which you have what I call low semantic depth modeling. And so what that means is that you have large numbers of objects, such as large numbers of players and large numbers of objects in a 3D database, but the number of things that they can do or that can happen to them is very small. So think something can move, it can shoot, it can die, but that's it. Or there, maybe there's 12 things or 15 things, but there aren't 10,000 things that can happen. And so you really want that to have semantic depth. And that's, I think, if you, if you want to get beyond the point and shoot paradigm, um, which means you have some broader range of human expression happening in the thing or some broader range of modeling or training or testing or something. If you want to have more value in the thing, you have to get beyond that. And very few people take on that challenge when, the, when they design networked virtual world software. And so in that sense, I indict the, the, mass, the, 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 the vast numbers of people doing online shared virtual games as not really tackling what they need to in order to make them human or humanly meaningful and useful and valuable. So anyway, so at least I'm able to name somebody who I think is trying to do that. Oh, 
I wonder what the rate of success of those weddings is compared to ones in physical reality. No, it might be better, you know, I, I, it's a, I wonder. Uh, it would be a good statistic. If there's any social scientists in the room, I think, I think there's a paper in that. Um, next number? Seven. Uh, and you know, in a way, I talked about this already. This is the problem of human acuity being so good. So there's a thing, I was talking about how evolution optimizes perfectly, but on top of ridiculous kludges. So um, you can get away with a lot more in almost any other product except for virtual reality. <laughs> you know, um, you can, uh, if people can distance themselves away from a television screen until it looks good and place it in their life so it looks good, but if it's like in front of your eye, you're stuck with it. You know, and there's a sense in which you have more freedom to adapt yourself to the flaws of every single other product in the world except for a virtual reality system. So this human acuity thing is a big challenge. Enough of that. Next number. I mean, what's, what's left? 11 oh, 11 is hiding. Isn't that typical of it? Boy. Yeah, this is the, the classic economic dilemma of people interested in doing VR non-industrially, which is you have to make the most expensive media device of all of them, and it's only good for one person at a time. That, that's just nasty, isn't it? But that's the way it is. It's just a really nasty fact of life for virtual reality. So you got, um, you know, <laughs> I mean, in a way, there's nothing more to say beyond that. But, uh, you know, you, you go to somebody and you say, well, how much is this entertainment device going to cost? A quarter million dollars. Wow, that's a lot. Well, at least you can, at least I can plow 500 people at a time through it. No, only one. Ah! So that, that conversation has been had many hundreds of times in the last 20 years by many, many a would-be entrepreneur. Um, there have been clever attempts to get around it. Um, one example is the motion ride. So that's been, there are various people who do those. A lot of people have gotten into it. And so that, the idea there is that you put a bunch of people, maybe like a dozen or something, on, on a platform with, with some kind of mechanical ability to move around, sometimes hydraulic or whatever, just different technologies. Then you surround them with, with big visuals and you blow cold air on them and you build this experience. And, and that's become a, a stock thing at trade shows. And there's some people who do it wonderfully. Um, and I'm, oh God, I don't know if it's, I'm getting older, but I'm forgetting the name of my friend who's, who does the, who's the guy who did the special effects for 2001? Help. Trumbull, Doug Trumbull, so, who I actually know, but I'm so spacey I can't remember it. So Doug, Doug probably does the, the best ones. He's really worked like crazy to make these things good and work on the, you know, the details of how the motion feels and all. And um, So that's one way to get around it. But even there, the throughput is pretty low. And the economics of that kind of ride entirely depend on psychological manipulation of people waiting online to use it, <laughs> right? So you try to stretch out the experience, and even though, and you try to make, even though they're actually only on the thing for a couple of minutes, the overall investment of time is like an hour and a half because of the long line, and you somehow make that feel so it adds to the substantiality instead of feeling like a hassle. And if you can pull off that trick, then all of a sudden the economics work. So it's so the margin is made of queue management. Isn't that strange? <laughs> sort of like the margin in the cinema business is the popcorn. The margin in the motion game business is the is the queue psychology. Um, so it's so um, it's it is tricky, and um, uh, at some point it gets cheap enough that it doesn't matter. I mean, hopefully, um, our our oracle of Moore's law will get us to the point where this becomes moot. So my guess my guess twenty years ago was twenty ten, and so like I said, I have seven years to be wrong, but I actually do think we're going to get there around then. All right, who, what's missing here? Ten. Oh, yeah, yeah. So 10 is a complicated one. This is sort of the marketing question. Um, now, this, this has to do with the, the problem that people, um, present company excluded, I'm sure, uh, don't, uh, don't just adapt to radical new changes in their lives willy-nilly. Somehow things have to be approached in a sensible manner that they can, because people don't have people who aren't devoted to thinking about user interface or exotic computer or media experiences uh, don't have the time to really consider this. So it has to kind of fit in gracefully. So as I mentioned here, the first personal computers looked like a typewriter. And they still kind of, they do a little bit, less so really. But um, that was, you know, that was because that's how they fit into your life. And uh, 
there's a, there's a sense in which you have to come up with something that people do already or some habit they have or some part of their home or you have to be able to colonize some aspect of life to put in this machine in such a way that it's only a gradient different from what's already there rather than telling people, hey, you're going to enter this whole new era where anything is possible, you know, <laughs> which, which suits, there's a certain emotional sensitivity, especially um, sensibility, this, especially people who are sort of revolutionary minded and people who want to turn on the world and want to be able to think, they want to just be able to go to people and say, hey, buy this box and everything changes. <laughs> but, you know, um, the vast majority of people in the world are not of that temperament and it has to fit in somehow to something that's already there. It has to be more incremental. And the truth is nobody's ever really articulated how VR use will be incremental. All right. Now, the, the enormous success of video games does point the way. And it's very possible that, that the VR introduction will also be called the um, PlayStation 4 or 5 or whatever it is. To, you know, um, that's, a, that's one possibility. And, and that's probably the most likely one at this point. The problem with that is that the corporate sensibility that runs the PlayStations with you know, these, these um, uh, Hollywood sort of themed games and this very controlled marketing and these closed systems is not going to be able to make VR that's good, in my opinion. Uh, it's a different, the, uh, it, why? Because VR is about expression and relationships, um, not about uh, characters and content. Uh, now, why is that true? I'll just give you my little slogan for this. The one thing that's more powerful and valuable in media than celebrity is vanity. You know, VR is not about Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's about you. You're, you're the star in the, in the virtual world. And so this notion that there's some studio that owns these contents that are the thing you're paying for is going to go away, and it'll be much more a communication thing. That's where the value is centered. That just seems to me plainly so. So this sort of centrally created and controlled media model that's been running PlayStation-like products since the uh, original Atari probably can't extend into social virtual reality. And um, I could be wrong about that. Uh, so far, I feel that. I feel more and more inclined to believe that point of view, though. For instance, you look at the incredible craze of online gaming, but you look at the failure, the relative failure of Sims Online, which is an attempt to meld online gaming with a central media model. And uh, I just don't think, it, I don't think they fit. So anyway, uh, whether or not the video game world turns into the virtual reality introduction into people's lives remains to be seen. Other candidates include, I'll, I'll get to you in a second. Um, other candidates include, it's the new home exercise thing. That's been tried actually a few times. Various people have tried to do that. Um, maybe it's the new home education thing. It's the way to tutor your kid. Maybe it's the new home, uh, home extent, um, adult education thing. It's how you learn music. Maybe it's the new home rehabilitation thing. It's how you work on that arm that was injured, people working on that. There's, so there are other candidates for what niche it fits into initially in the home, aside from gaming. And I'd, I wouldn't write any of those off yet. But at any rate, there'll be sort of a competition between these potential niches at some point when the other factors have gotten solved. And it'll be very interesting to watch. Um, in the back, I'm sorry, I know you've, you've had your hand up. <laughs> yeah, unfortunate terminology, but it's what we say. Yes. yes. Uh, <laughs> we have never had the killer app, the one that they have to have. Uh, you, you can't do it any other way kind of thing, right? And that's well, industrially we do, but in the home we don't. Industrially, we absolutely have killer apps for virtual reality. But those are so small, they don't drive the industry. Well, they drive a niche industry. I mean, there's somebody selling those things, and there's people. I mean, there there is an. It's not a huge one, but it's there, and it's important. It's 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 influential. Drug I discovery mean, is another one. Yeah. Selling those have gone out of business. No, 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 no. Three or four years. Not so. Not so. Not so. I mean, believe it or not, selling reality centers is still a profit center for for Silicon Graphics, which is otherwise a suffering company in many ways. You know, I mean, it's 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 a real market. It's just it's it's a small high-end market. You know, it's, it's real though. It's, it's a very real thing. It's just not, you know, it's just, it's, it, the problem, it's not only small, but it's capped. It, there's, nothing, there's no place for it to really go, but it is, it's there. Like a lot of other industrial markets, it's like, a, it's a niche market. Really, really, look it up. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, yeah. 
I think so too. I believe that. I believe that. I just don't know how to write it. I really want that thing. Um, was I in the middle of a number? Or am I ready for the next? I think I'm ready for the next one. What's another? What's missing here? Six. Let's see. What's six? Liability problems. Yeah, you know, this is really, there's a funny thing about the way our society is going that the enforcers now are the insurance companies. Like, you know, it's not a snooty church telling you what you can't do, and it's not an authoritarian government telling you what you can't do, and it's not overbearing parents. It's like the insurance company. So uh, <laughs> um, this, is, this is a serious issue, and it's the, the few times, there have been a few kind of um, home virtual reality scares where it appeared that some toy company or something was about to try to introduce like a, a VR system, and, and this is the issue that usually squashed it. I think it probably wouldn't have succeeded anyway. I think most of the ones that were, oh, come on, <laughs> idiot thing, God. Anyway, um, the, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, don't, I know, there's a lot of jokes about what viruses would be like in virtual reality. It's not, it's not pretty, but um, anyway, um, yeah, the, yeah, so this, this, this liability thing is a big deal. And um, it, the problem with it is that you combine liability problems come up when expectations fall awry. So um, pe people are willing to sell bicycles even though kids will get in bike accidents because the world expects kids to get in bike accidents. But VR, since it's like this physical thing, there, there inevitably would be accidents, but people don't think that an information system should cause a physical injury. Although, I mean, we have carpal tunnel and so forth, but like a falling over kind of injury isn't expected from your computer. So um, because the expectations are set against that kind of problem, it'll be, it'll be a very difficult transition to making those insurable. Um, I think from, an, you know, from a rational or statistical point of view, it's not really a problem, but I think it will, in fact, be a problem. And I think that'll delay things by a few years. Um, my, my guess is that if the prediction of 2010 is wrong, this might be the, this is one of the likely reasons it might be wrong, depending. But of course, who knows what our society will be like then? It's changing so fast. Um, maybe, maybe something else will be the more controlling factor after all by then. Um, all right, so let's see. Uh, nine, I haven't done nine yet, right? Okay. Um, yeah, so here's, this is, this is in a way a little painful to admit. I have to say, 20 years ago, I would have thought by now that this one wouldn't really need to be on the list to the degree it does need to be on the list. But we still have got some basic work to do in just sorting out what, the, what a VR machine looks like. All right, so some of the unsolved problems. Um, the most serious one probably is general haptics. So I mentioned haptics is touch and feel. So. Um, you can imagine a general haptics device being like, like say if you put a glove on your hand and you could feel anything. Well, not so easy because you, to feel something you have to be able to push against it. So what exactly is going to keep that glove from moving if it's just on your hand? So it has to be attached to something. All of a sudden it gets pretty hard to imagine. Well, if it's attached to something, what kind of attachment lets you move freely while still constraining it? Uh, that gets pretty hard, all right? It actually does. There's, suddenly, you run into mechanical anomaly problems that are deep. You can't, you, you can't just say, oh, somebody can come up with the right kind of joint mechanism to do that. Well, no, actually, it's really hard. Um, I mean, I'll give you an example of the model I've been working with in my head for the last 10 years or so, and this is, um, this is the octopus model, which can... Ken Salisbury didn't come, did he? Oh, okay. Well, there's a guy at Stanford named Ken. I talk to you about this a lot. He's a robotics professor. Um, so there's this octopus. I, I like cephalopods a lot. And um, there's an octopus called the mimic octopus that can change shape for chem for, to, to achieve camouflage. Oh, I should have. I should have brought a video of it to show you. Darn, it's so cool to watch. Anyway, it can change shape, and it's very spectacular to watch it. It morphs, and the reason it's not famous is when people see it, they think it's a computer thing. Like, it, if it wasn't discovered until after morphing was popular. If it had been discovered before the morph effect became popular, it would be, like, the most famous animal in the world, I think. But so I got interested, like, how does this thing do it? And I've been really interested in its muscles, and it's a wonderful musculature. It's a hierarchy of muscles where there's big ones on, in, the, in the first layer that give it a general shape and then they're finer and finer ones to refine the shape. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Plus, of course, it can move its tentacles around in really interesting, clever ways to make different shapes. So um, 
we start with an earlier model from 20 years ago called the Butler robot. So you remember I was talking about this issue slamming your, your uh, hand down on a tabletop and there's nothing really there. Well, one way for there to be something there is that there would be this, this um, robot that's reminiscent of a butler that comes around with a platter just in time. So it's watching your hand and it's doing a calculation. Your hand is moving. I'm looking in the database and I see a tabletop. Hey, the hand's gonna hit the tabletop. Quick, grab the flat surface and, whoop, and then, then by the time you hit it, it's there. And hopefully in getting it there, it hasn't walloped you and you haven't heard the swish of air and so forth. But at any rate, at least the, given various problems, at least hypothetically, there's a way to get that surface there. And indeed people have built ro butler robot type things and there's a history of those now of different sorts. Mostly um, the people who love building sort of goofy robotic interfaces for VR are the Japanese. And, and uh, uh, there's a few labs uh, in, in Tokyo and Kyoto where you can find the goofiest sort of robotic attempts at, at, at getting this, which are really delightful. Anyway, so now combine this with the, with the octopus and imagine that you build a fake octopus that can change its shape and, and you have this, this thing moving this thing in front of your hand and you can get arbitrary shapes. Combine that with sort of scrollable skin so that as you move, you can create the illusion that you're moving your hand over something that's actually bigger than the octopus device, if you follow that then you can start to imagine a path towards a general haptics interface. And um, we actually know how to build at least a crude version of every piece of technology in this chain to create that effect, although no one's ever been able to achieve the whole construction. Um, there are various people attempting to build something at least a little like it with some compromise here or there. And I think we'll get there eventually. You know, I mean, I believe that something like this will come about, but I don't yet know quite what it'll look like. And um, it's a, it, but it's a big hunk of a problem. Now, another problem is very simply the display technology. And the issue, there's, there's one problem, which is uh, most people don't really like wearing stuff on their heads all the time, you know, and it's, that's always been an issue. So, like, so you can try to make it cool. You can say, hey, it's like the Rolling Stones, man. Like, like, it's just like sunglasses. It's really cool to wear goggles, you know. I tried that, and it kind of works on 12-year-olds, but a lot of people are like, I don't want to wear, you know, people, a lot of people just sort of feel like if they wear glasses already, they wear them enough, and if they don't wear them, they don't want to start wearing them. And like, there's a psychological thing about wearing things on your head. Um, now, the, the, there's, a, there's a technical term for a screen that looks 3D even though it isn't on your head. So if your head doesn't have anything on it, that's called auto stereo. And there are a lot of ways to make auto stereo. Auto stereo is an incredible field of research in its own right because there's about 20 distinct technical approaches, none of which have quite really met the spec you want, but all of which have gotten tantalizingly close and all of which are extraordinarily sophisticated and are at the edge of what's possible in optics because Unfortunately, light wavelengths are really big from the perspective of designing auto stereo screens and you run into all these problems of, you know, every time you think of some design you think should work, it turns out that the pieces have to be too small to really do what you want to light waves. You know, it's, it's the craziest thing. So you go, you just torture yourself trying to design it. And there, every year or so somebody comes up with a new clever, lately, everyone come, every year or so somebody comes up with a new clever approach to auto stereo. Um, Something came up, there's a guy named, I think, Otachi, Otachi, um, who's a Japanese scholar who wrote a, a book in the 70s that was um, the, the, you know, the, the world of auto stereo up to that time. But he uncovered something amazing when the, um, a, after the fall of the Soviet Union, which is that there had been a secret auto stereo research pro project under Stalin at a scale, at a Manhattan project like scale, because Stalin believed he could build the ultimate propaganda machine to control a population by getting auto stereo right. And they built incredible, th I mean, some wild. So, yeah. No, auto stereo means you have nothing on your head, but you still see the 3D illusion. And it's tricky. It involves having to send out um, separate images to each of your eyes, so the eyes don't see the same thing. And in some versions, you can actually focus on different depths. So the, it's, a, it's a hard technology. It involves really fancy optics. Now, some forms of auto stereo aren't so hard and are very commonly seen. So for instance, you can now buy a thing called the lenticular screen, which is where you have um, little um, prisms, and each prism covers a bunch of little subpixels. And then according to which angle you look at it, you see a different subpixel, and only that one. And each eye will probably see different, different wedges coming out of the prisms. So um, the company Stereo Graphics from Marin here sells these things called synthograms. Which, uh, Lenny, Lip Lenny Lipton designs them. He's the guy who wrote the song Puff the Magic Dragon, strangely enough, anyway. So Lenny makes these screens up in, in Marin. 
And um, if you move your head around, you'll, you'll get a 3D illusion and you're not wearing anything. And so that lenticular thing is the simplest. Now the problem with the lenticules is that there, it's fixed wedges coming out that each have a different image. And so if you move in or out, your eyes won't be in separate ones or they'll be, you know, so you, you have to be at a fixed distance pretty much. And if you move too far, you'll, you'll be out of the zone of the wedges and you'll cycle through them again or something will go wrong. So it's like, it's not, it's not as general as you'd like, but it's still cool. And if we had the time, I could describe 20 other technical approaches, and some of them are wonderful. Just do a Google search on auto stereo, and you'll be amazed at what people are doing. I mean, it's just wild. But anyway, nothing's ever quite clicked yet. We're so, so tantalizingly close, and yet there's not quite the general auto stereo technique that you really want. And there's another problem, which is um, if you... <laughs> If you want to have social virtual worlds, which I think you do, obviously um, this gets a little bit complicated. But um, in so let, let me give you two points on a spectrum of how people look to each other in a in a virtual world. One is a highly abstract or fantastic avatar. So you turn into a, a dragon or something, and maybe if you really do a good job, the dragon has your expressions. And and we've done that. That's really fun. So you can make it smile. And it looks like your smile, and people can tell it's you and all. So you can do that. And at the other end of the spectrum, it's, it's photorealistic, so it really looks like you. And we've done that too, actually. That's, that's doable at this point. Many people are surprised by that, but it is. So um, the interesting thing is that in studies of different sorts of users, most people feel the most comfortable and the least self-conscious at neither extreme, but somewhere in the middle. And there are all sorts of interesting cultural effects. Different people from different cultures feel, feel comfortable at different points in the spectrum. And there's a big gender difference, which I, I don't, don't throw tomatoes at me or anything, but it just appears to be there in the data. Um, men appear to be a little bit more focused on how the other side looks, whereas women are more concerned about how they look. And um, a lot of female users um, seem to enjoy what I like to call um, adorned realism, where where one's hair, clothing, circumstances, surroundings can be changed, but the basic face is there. So, uh, so you have sort of the freedom from worrying about how you look in a lot of ways, but are still authentic and un unmodified in some other ways. And that appears to be the point of comfort. Anyway, the reason I'm telling you all of that is that in order to achieve that effect, obviously you can't have stuff on people's heads. I mean, you, well, you sort of can. I mean, if you're wearing, because otherwise people would see each other wearing goggles, right? You see that, right? Okay, so the, the, there's a way around that, which is that if you wear goggles, but the goggles have visual sensors inside them so that you can synthesize what the person would look like if they weren't wearing goggles, that is one way to do it. And that's possible, and that's also been done. But it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, that's really, it, 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 it's, it's, an, it's just an awkward thing to do. So the better thing to do is to have an auto stereo thing so people, so, but if you have an auto stereo thing, then there's this, then all of a sudden your movements are restricted because you have to be looking at the auto stereo screen. And the one rule, if I can teach you one lesson about optics tonight, it's that photons won't make right angle turns in midair. Okay, so um, there's a lot of there's a lot of problems. But I, I'm I get pissed off at photons sometimes. Let me tell you, <laughs> you know, I just really wish they would do some things that they refuse to do. All right, and I just think they're just honorary little things. But um, one, <laughs> but the basic thing, you know, you, it, you can't see a display element unless there's some optical element in your line of sight. You can't you can't have some. You know, this is, I mean, DARPA has funded people who claim that they could make some hologram appear in the middle of somewhere. And the only way you can do that if, is if there's, like, you could have some particle of dust or a water droplet or some smoke or something. But there has to be something that the photon hits. You can't have a photon come like that. And so, um, so, th so in order to have people be able to see these imaginary things that aren't there, they have to be looking at some sort of uh, optical surface of some kind. So you can't just sort of walk around without unencumbered in reality and just see things floating there. It's just not doable. You have to, now we, ha oh my God, have we gone to great lengths to try to create that illusion. For instance, um, there was this thing called the Teleimmersion Initiative, which was a bunch of schools trying to improve these illusions. And we did this one insane thing where uh, you would uh, have laser lights, um, create like um, stereo, how does how this work? We had, you were wearing, were you wearing glasses? 
you were wearing glasses, but very minimal ones that just, um, I guess they, they flickered alternately. And then there would be like little laser lights that would project um, each image on, on whatever surfaces happened to be there color corrected to create an, illusor, an illusory object that would pop forward in the middle of a space. You can sort of do things like that. But once again, this is, this is the point where you're getting into ridiculous territory. Um, yeah. Isn't, isn't the idea of not wearing the headset uh, directly contradict the idea of having a haptic robot in the room with you? That's tricky. Um, there are ways. Here, there's a way around that, and you won't. I know you're going to think I'm nuts, but um, there's also there's another thing I've been working on that's partially to address this problem, which is to make um, uh, invisible objects. So the way you make an invisible object is you have an object that has camera rays embedded in it, but also has auto stereo displays as its surface, and it shows you from whatever direction you look what would be there if it wasn't there. And I'm actually building some stuff like this, and look for a very interesting car at Burning Man sometime. But at any rate. What, what, what? Yes, but, the, but when the insurance inspectors come, they won't be able to find me. <laughs> um, so, so what you do is you have, you have the haptic octopus that's there for you to touch, but it's also invisible in that sense, so it pretends not to be there. I don't know. Look, give me 20 years on that one, all right? <laughs> that, but that's the sort of, believe it or not, that's the sort of thing we're talking about these days. I'm, I have no, like, the problem, it's a little bit like the auto stereo problem. A lot of these things, you can come up with a conceptual strategy, but it's at the limits of what's possible in engineering. And so you push that for a while to discover where the limit is, and then you adjust the strategy and find a better compromise. So it's a sort of a, I found that to solve these, these virtual reality interface problems, you have to do this sort of zigzag thing where first you, you, you come up with a crazy thing, and you actually try to build it just to sort of see where, where it breaks. And then based on that, you, come, you go to the side with a sort of a better approach. And then you get crazy again. And then gradually, you can find some configuration that, that's possible. And I, I don't know. But anyway, the, the, the overall headline of this crazy discussion is just that we don't really know how to do haptics. We don't know how to do networked stereo yet. Um, the, both of those problems remain unsolved in terms of just basic configuration ideas, although they're promising leads and interesting hacks in both cases already. Yeah. Is there any? Oh, we're just plugging it into the brain. All right. Yeah, that's that's a question that always comes up, and um, the, there is a great deal of work, mostly at mostly for prosthetics. And um, the state of the art in that work is very, very advanced for audio. Um, and there's some impressive um, direct, maybe, let's say direct to brain is too dramatic to be accurate, but direct to central nervous system stimulation for the sense of hearing. For sight, there are examples of that, and even of spatial fields of, of uh, virtual light dots that have been created through simulation of the, of the visual cortex directly. And they're, they're, they're very impressive and important. Um, and so why, so why don't I just wait for those? Why am I fooling around with these crazy devices? It might very well turn out that some sort of direct brain interface is more practical than the crazy device angle. That's a possibility. Now, the reason I believe it's still worth it to play with the crazy devices is um, I, I do work in modeling the nervous system, too. And, um, and I've particularly worked with a neuroscientist studying vision. And that's been very helpful in some machine vision techniques that have been important to these things. And um, the more you work on that, the more you feel that while this is doable in a hypothetical sense, it's a really long haul. That now there are people who disagree. Like I mean, if you talk to Ray Kurzweil, he'll say there's going to be this. Uh, all of these um, forces will start working together to create an acceleration of understanding of how to interface with the brain. So there'll be better data gathering and automated data analysis and AI programs that solve this problem and that problem. And all of a sudden, one day, you know how to do it. Maybe um, I don't think that's so. Remember, evolution is a pile of ridiculous, insane kludges optimized to perfection. And, and untangling it and going backwards and figuring out how to interface to it is, is likely to be an extraordinarily huge job. I mean, after all, remember, if it was easy to do, evolution would have just undone the kludges instead of optimizing the ridiculous kludges, right? So it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's a hard. You have to climb up the energy landscape of the design space, and it's a huge climb. So I think it'll be really hard. That's my, that's my sense of it. 
and I don't think there's any way to, to, I don't think that Moore's law of computation is steep enough to make the climb over this other steep thing easy. I, I just think that it's an even harder thing. Um, so that's one thing. There's another thing, though, which I want to say, which is a bit more of a philosophical point, which is that um, the, uh, uh, the sense organs are the language of the brain. You know, the way the brain, the, 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 way, the, way the brain and the sense organs are not separate. I, and, and this is a, if when I give my intro to, this is different from my usual intro to virtuality talk, but when I give, like for a freshman class or something, I give my first intro to virtuality talk, I talk about the metaphors we use to understand the brain. And in our current era of having PCs and you can plug in your little USB webcam and your microphone, we tend to think of, a, of that as a metaphor for the brain. So you say, well, hey, the brain is like the CPU, and then you plug in the eyes, which are like cameras, you plug in the ears, which are like your microphone. Now, I think when you work with virtual reality systems, you come up with a very different metaphor, which is that the brain is a spy submarine, and its assignment is to do subconscious experiments on the environment in order to tease out as much information as possible. And so subconscious head motion and eye motion, the cycads, um, these are little experiments your nervous system is doing to, to, to experiment with the environment, to line up edges, and, to, and it's that interactivity that really makes it work. Now, the reason I'm saying that is that because that's the way your brain works, the particular nature of your sense organs created the patterning of your whole brain. It's not like your brain evolved as like this, you know, Intel processor awaiting something to be interfaced to. You had the sense organs and the brain sort of grew on top of it. and so. Um, in order to make sense of interfacing to the brain, you probably have to simulate the sense organs anyway. And then as I, as if, if, I do the, if I do the conceptual exercise in my mind of fully simulating what an eye or an ear can do in, in, with head motions in a real environment, it's a very complicated thing, and I think about the crazy mechanisms I was talking about, as crazy as the mechanisms get, I still think they're less crazy. <laughs> so that's my own path of thought around these things. It very well could turn out that a direct interface is more viable because these other things do really, they do get insane. But sometimes insane things work. I mean, look inside a car, you know. So <laughs> I want to talk about these, but anyway. Yeah. Oh, are we running out of time, by the way? I know some people. What time am I supposed to stop? 9.30. Okay. All right. Well, I'm starting to do questions in the midst of it, but yeah, go ahead. Possibilities of VR, but I guess one of the. <coughs> oh, yeah, we can run my skew. That's probably better. I don't know. Is this alive? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. I think we're very focused on the social interaction aspects of uh, VR, but. You know, given two spatial dimensions and the fact that you can do, you know, dozens and dozens of dimensions in two-dimensional space, mm -hmm. how much is it really necessary to add a third spatial dimension? To Life really get itself all that stuff is done? not necessary. I mean, I, I, to me, it's like this glorious, wonderful exploration. I don't, I don't, I don't believe. It. I mean, you know, on, pure, on a purely rational basis, most of what we do is ridiculous. I mean, you know, I, this to me is art. It's like beauty. Now, I mean, some of it we need. Like, I mean, there are people alive today because their surgeries were modeled and improved in virtual reality, and there was no other way to do it. So, yes, sometimes you need it. As I pointed out, you can have, even if you can do something with virtual reality you couldn't do without it, as in the case of expanding the apparent oil supply, it might not even be a good thing. The unintended consequences might be bad. Um, I think it's very dull to try to to think in a utilitarian fashion about absolutely everything and also a fool's game because there's no absolute standard anyway. Um, I, I, th I think that um, we humans have to have some sort of forward direction and we basically have a choice of a forward direction that's based on, like we can either try to be in stasis and say, hey, everything's good and all we'll do now is be really good, recycling, politically correct, calm, um, obedient people, it's not going to happen. We're, that's not our nature. So the forward direction we can choose from is being ever more powerful and clever with technology, in which case something will blow up and it'll be really bad. Or I think the alternative is this other path of trying to figure out new ways of connecting with each other, which is where I think this fits in. So I do think this is actually necessary for human survival in that sense. Um, let's see, so will this guy wake up? Are there any numbers I haven't done yet? Um, Expectations, basic idea, liability, charlatans, interface components, expensive data, slow computers, Gates Envy. Yeah, I guess I covered all 11. So any other questions? Yeah. Just a comment. 
It's just, just, I mean, it was based upon a conversation that I had recently with a friend. And sorry, sorry. It was I, I a conversation about GPS, using GPS and GPS and, and global positioning. GP, global positioning, uh -huh. and that eventually planes will fly on point to point, shortest point. You know, there's so much echo. I'm afraid I can't make out your words. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, oh, well. Mm. Okay. I, I mean, I answered the previous question not so much on the 2D versus 3D, but on sort of what I considered the more fundamental thing of just trying to expand interfaces to enhance beauty and depth of experience in general. Um, on the specifics of 2D versus 3D, human cognition is fundamentally 2.5D. Um, so neither fully 3D nor 2D nor only 2D is an accurate reflection of the most optimal um, state of interaction for humans. Um, humans, if you want a, a true 3D animal is a cephalopod, a smart octopus or squid or cuttlefish does think in three dimensions. And if you do experiments with them in terms of watching them hunt or how they predict motion of other animals in their environment, you'll see a 3D thinker and they do things we cannot do. Um, what, um, but 2D is also not accurate for us. I mean, we are two and a half, we're depth map creatures. So we, we, we have within our brains some specific sort of two and a half D maps, the, the environment we're walking around on, the world in front of us, and also this one wrapped around us, uh, which has a specific place in the brain of things that are close to us, which is sort of a, a wrapped 2D thing. So um, if, if what you want is something that's the most human, you'd look at two and a half D. Um, and I think there's, there's a great value in that, but I think there's also a great value in stretching and in trying to push us in directions that might not be as natural since most of, you know, since we're creatures of culture and, and uh, nurture as well as nature. Um, and then as far as the specifics of aviation, virtual reality has played a significant role in air traffic control. And um, there's a local project run by a guy named Ron Reisman at NASA Ames in virtual reality interfaces for air traffic control. Um, and some of the innovations from that have found their way into widespread use, especially in the military. And it has been, I think it has been highly useful. It's also used to run harbors and all kinds of things. Um, I'm not sure if I, he would want me to, Ron Reisman is the guy I was thinking of, but just look up air traffic control and virtual reality on Google. You have Google these days. You don't need me for this. Come on. It's 2003. All right, what? Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, the, pl yeah, the places where 3D is the only option are in uh, chemistry, for in, in pharmaceuticals, in medicine, volumetric uh, medical data and surgical simulation, in, um, in geology, oil field modeling, and, and um, earthquake understanding, and so forth, um, and uh, in various uh, niche areas in science and uh, astronomy, and so forth. There are a whole bunch of domains that are fundamentally 3D. In a lot of cases, you have the choice of dimensionality. I mean, you can, um, I mean, you can, you can, if 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 it's abstract, you can just decide how you want to see it. And as I say, in general, two and a half D is really the optimum for people. Um, let me take you the closer one first, and then you after. So, yeah. Uh huh. Right. Mm, well, no, actually, that's not true. A lot of the flight simulators do use head mounts. I mean, for instance, um, the, uh, the Air Force's helicopter simulators have used head mounts for decades. And uh, it, de it really depends on the particular device. And it has to do, it, it really ha it's, it's a technical calculation in each case, which is the better strategy. So head mounts do play a role in, in, uh, in, in simulators. And, uh, it's, and, and haptics, typically the, haptic, the haptics feedback is just in, in uh, simulated responses in, in, 
in instrumentation itself. Because, and, and the reason for that is clear, that we don't have the general haptics device, as I, was, as I was explaining before. In the case of the display, out the window versus head mount is a technical calculation. In the case of flight simulators, it usually works out to be easier to do an out the window display, but often head mounts also play a role. And um, indeed, that's why I mentioned that the Kaiser um, product earlier. That's an example of one of many products that fulfill that particular market's need for head mounts. Uh, because that's the, that's the market that can afford the fanciest ones. And also the very Absolutely, yeah. One of the definitions of virtual reality I've 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 proposed is a general purpose simulator as opposed to a special purpose one. That's a dividing line where, uh, when you build a flight simulator, you know in advance what it'll be used for. Yeah. Um, by the way, I might mention one reason. I, I was uh, present at the attack in New York. I used to live at the base of the Trade Center, and this week's very hard for me. But I, I remember when that happened and uh, the, I had done some work on things that went into the particular simulators that the guys had used to learn to, to um, you know, kill a bunch of my friends. And I, it's been really devastating. And I, and it just, but it does show the sort of unintended consequences of, of these technologies. So I mentioned the oil one and this is another one. And uh, this is, you know, the, it's a very hard thing to be an idealist and to be a technologist because the, the problem is that anything we do is empowering humans and we're, humans are so imperfect and so uh, you, you, can't, you can't pretend that anything you do will only do good. There's absolutely no such thing. Anything that empowers people will bring about this very complex result, some of which will inevitably be tragic if you did something potent at all. Uh, so it's very hard. It's a hard business. It takes, it takes a long range sense of faith and, and, and you have to be able to call upon principles that are far beyond what's immediately in front of you. Um, let me, uh, you in the, the white t-shirt, who, yeah. Could you mention some of the things, you said you go back to Body Electric, um, even though it's antiquated, there's still some good things about it. And could you yeah. touch on some of the things and what, compare it to, there's some mainstream visual programming languages like Max that, you know, what's missing from that Kind of well, an approach, not in particular. Actually, no, Max, I think Max has a lot of good qualities. It's just a different, it's a, it's a very different problem domain. Max, for those of you, you're thinking of the MIDI, the, the um, yeah. So Max is a tool that's a, a visual box and arrow data flow tool for music and sound. And it's a, um, it works both in the domain of events, which unfortunately in music are MIDI events, and on the domain of uh, digital signal processing, where you can move waves around and do things to them. And, and recently also in video processing. Um, and it's a, it's a cool device. Body Electric is rather similar to Max. I would say the main differences are that it has much better real-time feedback. So for instance, you can, um, you, can, you can put little sensors into the network and get much more useful data very, very quickly. You can also change the network while it's running much more easily. But programming in real time and what you were saying. The real time and see instant, instant effects. Part. And then also it's optimized for all the stuff that comes up in virtual reality. I mean, it really deals with object collisions and object and, and matrix hierarchies and, and all this kind of stuff. It's like really a 3D domain program. Um, and it's also tied in with all the special issues of modeling, like, you know, where, where the uh, you know, the, that if this object is supposed to sit on this object, it, it has to be that part of that object. And you have to calculate, you know, it's all these little, all these just little simple things that are actually kind of hard to do. And, and a lot of the 3D tools don't really do that. A lot of the 3D tools don't uh, get to that level. The, the one that Paul Milanek is doing does very well, though. It's a, it's a good one. But Max, Max has, the, the, there's, people have done 3D extensions to Max, but they're at this sort of elemental level that's almost useless because they don't, they don't acknowledge any of the properties of 3D objects that make them three-dimensional in the way they interact with each other. Now, if you're the person who wrote that code, my apologies, I'm sorry. I never know. Oh, you know my name's Anti Orp, I wrote NATO. What? <laughs> NATO. Oh, you're, are you NATO? No, I'm just joking. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, you probably, you probably want to say that sitting closer to the exit door, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> For those of you who don't know, NATO is like some um, mythical character who puts out this sort of uh, uh, kind of interest, it's kind of a weird uh, video effect software that a lot of artists use. And whoever writes NATO claims to be this collective and disrupts very rudely online artists boards and nobody quite knows who they are and it's this whole crazy thing. Anyway, yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about why we're two and a half D and octopuses are three D? Oh yeah, yeah, okay, so people, um, people uh, are very poor at generalized 3D thinking, particularly if it involves the, the rotation degrees of freedom, not just translation. 
We're, um, we're poor at moving that way, we become nauseous, and we're poor at thinking that way. Um, however, we do get a lot from 2 and a half D. We're very good. So um, when you assess, uh, for instance, you can walk around in a room and you're very good at avoiding obstacles. You're aware they stick out. Uh, and so, and so you're, not, you're, not gonna, you're not just looking at a 2D map. You can have a sense of their elevations. But if you're navigating in a 3D world with complex 3D things in all, in all directions, you have a much harder time navigating. And there's a, there's a real cutoff point in which people can deal with um, a, uh, uh, a 2D surface with a considerable amount but a constrained amount of third dimensional activity versus um, a fully three dimensional environment where all three degrees of freedom have the same amount of variation. There's a, people just uh, can't, no, can't negotiate those as well. But they certainly can do much more than just 2D. So I call it two and a half D. I mean, I, the term, there isn't really great terminology for this, but um, you can understand a Manhattan, but you have a hard time understanding the inside of a cell. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the way of the human mind. Yeah. Well, no, there's none. There's none that does everything. There's, a, there's, a, there's. So is there one that's like good enough or close enough or, or uh, to play with? Uh, for for modeling, there's the Paul Milanic one. For inner, for social stuff in avatars, there's the Philip Rosedale one I mentioned. For general stuff, including dynamics and quick mock-up, at this point, there's nothing that I'm aware of, and it's a shame. I mean, I and I sort of feel bad saying that because there's probably a lot of people who wish I would say I like their particular thing, and I, I don't know what to say. Nothing's really inspired me that does the whole the whole range of things at this at this time. Yeah. There's an arcade game called San Francisco Rush that came out a while ago. Uh -huh. um, and and I, I thought it was both really impressive and kind of sad that um, they went and they digitized the visual experience of driving through San Francisco in a bunch of different paths. Um, I mean, they, they took some artists and they took digital pictures in all directions and, uh -huh. they, and they, they mapped it into, into surfaces so that you could drive around, around the city. And it's, it's an impressive amount of work that they must have done to build this, and it's kind of sad that probably that whole model gets thrown away at the end and, and they go do a new game. And it seemed to me that it would be really interesting and possibly powerful if there were some sort of a standard that people who built a world like that could make the data available and share it among themselves, and you could build up a database of digitized real-world locations as a basis for virtual worlds instead of starting at yeah. cube, cube land. Well, um, you know, this issue of standards I, I talked about a little bit at the beginning of the talk, that the problem here is that the standards are genuinely hard to write. And um, I think now there's sort of, um, there are a few sorts of standards that one could think about. Um, there's the sort of GL-like like standard where you say, I have, um, po polygonated forms, and I have textures that are registered on them, and I, ha I can maybe have some light sources and this and that, and and make I can extend it and describe some shaders, and that's my database. That's that's one level that's pretty well understood. Um, if you want to have something with moving parts, there's no standard there, but there are a few ideas about it. Um, if you want to have something you can really use in virtual reality, though, there isn't any. There isn't anything. Now, uh, is, does the knowledge exist to create that standard at this point? Um, God, it would be contentious to get everybody to agree. It's, it's it, hypothetically possible there are enough people with enough experience that could be civil enough in a room at once to, to make something. Um, but it would be a huge, huge project. And I'm not even sure if it still wouldn't be premature. I think maybe we need some more experience with a variety of different applications before we're ready for that. Now, there's, a, there's an interesting question, though. Now, we, we do know ways to derive, if it's static data, if it's like just a city, it's much easier than if it's a model of something like the inside of a cell or an arm or something where they're move, complicated moving parts in relation to one another. So 
If it's a city, it's a little easier. Um, there might someday be interesting ways to derive old data from those things. Maybe we'll have like robots that play the game and derive the data out of it or something like, I don't know. But um, it's, if there's something that gets to a user interface and it can still at least turn on and run in a few years, at least it won't be lost. I mean, all the stuff that's just stored on files probably will be, so. Um, uh, I just want to see if there's anyone else since I've, I've already had one from you. But no, okay, so. or modeling static objects, and then there aren't really standards for modeling a dynamic object. I, do I have the, the wrong sense that each successive Pixar feature film release, they build that software from scratch? They build those modeling well, systems you know, from scratch? Well, you know, Pixar, bye, bye those of you who are leaving. Uh, um, so, yeah, Pixar does wonderful stuff, but it's totally different. I mean, they're, they're not doing real-time interactive. So almost nothing they do is reusable in, in anything related to virtual reality. It's a different world. They do some motion capture and stuff that relates to, to real-time um, elements, but um, that not, none of their stuff is applicable to this. May, the tiniest bit, but their, their world is so different. They have, they're very much thinking about the frustum of the camera, you know, and they're very much, um, they, it's just a whole different, it's a different world. So it's, it doesn't really apply across. I, I adore it. I think I have the highest respect for what they're doing, but it doesn't really, uh, unfortunately, it doesn't really apply. Have we reached a, okay, uh, ooh, what? <laughs> um, I guess I'm just trying to get my head around exactly like how to work like what's happening in 2D, 3D gaming. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I think, um, uh, I think the uh, ACID test for a VR standard is the inside of a cell. It should be able to represent a cell, dy cell dynamics where you have um, uh, vast numbers of things interacting in vast numbers of ways. Um, and uh, uh, that, the, so to me that's the, um, because the thing is, it's computationally impossible to represent a cell from first principles, even though it's hypothetically possible. So you'd have to be able to come up with like gross structures like this is my molecule representation rather than working from quantum field theory or something. So, um, so uh, you, you know, that, that's the acid test. I, my, se my sense of the time frame in which humanity will know how to make that standard is a century in all seriousness. And so what we're going to have is a succession, of, a, a succession of approximations until we get there. So some of the earlier signposts on the way would be, um, oh, the muscles in an arm, which we know how to simulate, but not in any standard way. So we can do it, but there's no way to represent it in a standard way right now. Um, so that would be a good one. That's something we can do, but not in a way that's transferable. One of the things that I always rant about at certain sorts of meetings is that there are, at this point, dozens of wonderful dynamic surgical simulations, each done by people who've committed their lives to maintaining the code in the basement of some medical school somewhere, including a number of local poor souls. Um, there's no example of any of those being used at all in any place other than their building of origin. No, that's, I should say, if it's only a teaching tool without predictive power, then they, then they can be commercialized. And in fact, there's, like, there, there's a few companies that are selling training tools. Uh, but for something that's like a real, like a tissue healing predictor or something, I've never seen one used in other than the medical school where it was made. So, so you know, we know how to make them, but we don't know how to make the standard for them. So that might be sort of like a good place to look for the next, the next uh, plateau. Hey, since we're done with questions, I want to plug a book. Is that all right? And my, my, uh, I, I, if I had more commercial sensibility, I would have done it before all those people left. But anyway, this is the thing. It just came out yesterday. It's called The New Humanists, and it's, it's a bunch of people debating, including me, about the, the eternal cosmic issues, and it's kind of fun. So it's called The New Humanist. All right, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you.